Coming up on DTNS, Google wants to show you just how many meetings you have, South Korea frees in-app payments, and why Apple might put satellite connectivity into an iPhone. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 31st, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about family and friends, and we didn't bring up Fast and Furious once. If you want to hear that conversation, go get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join top patrons like DeGracia A. Daniels, Erwin Sturr, and Ken Hayes. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Central Bank of Nigeria will work with Barbados-based blockchain and payment startup BitInc to launch the nation's e narrow CBDC, or Central Bank Digital Currency, later this year. The government of the Central Bank, Goodwin F MFL, said that the digital currency should increase cross-border trade, also speed up remittances, and improve payment systems efficiency and tax recollection. Bose announced the Quiet Comfort 45 over the ear headphones with improved noise cancellation and a claimed 24 hours on a charge. Noise canceling headphones. Available for pre order now for $330, shipped in September 23rd. Meanwhile, Jabra updated its Elite line of earbuds, and the Elite 7 Pro promises nine hours of battery life with active noise cancellation on, just in tiny little earbuds, and 35 hours with the charging case. Those are $199. There's also the Elite 7 Active with Shake Grip. That supposedly keeps them in your ears while you're working out. That's $179. And the Budget Elite 3 with no noise cancellation, but only $79. The Elite 3 goes on sale September 1st. The Elite 7 Pro and 7 Active will be available to buy on October 1st. My Jabras do not fall out of my ears while I'm working out, but... Probably a nice feature for some. A couple pieces of news in music technology. Apple acquired the Dutch classical music streaming service Primephonic. The existing Primephonic service will shut down on September 7th and relaunch with a new app in 2022. Current subscribers can get a six-month free trial of Apple Music and port over their existing playlists. Meanwhile, Axios' sources say that Amazon Music is developing a live audio feature that it would pay musicians and celebrities to use for live shows and events. Bloomberg reports that public interest company the Nippon Foundation and Japan's largest shipping company, Nippon Yusen, plan to have a container ship pilot itself, no crew, on a 380-kilometer voyage from Tokyo Bay to the coastal city of Ise in February. It would be the first test of an autonomous ship in a heavy traffic marine area. Autonomous ships are considered necessary in Japan, as 40% of Japan's crew are 55 years or old, older, and the workforce is shrinking. Plus, 70% of shipping accidents are caused by human error. China's S-Volt showed off a cobalt-free 82.5 kilowatt hour capacity battery at the Chengdu Motor Show. S-Volt claims that the battery can deliver a range of 373 miles and do zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds. Cobalt is in short supply. Sometimes it's mined with child labor and environmentally destructive to extract. Cobalt is problematic. So if S-Fold can reach its promised capacity, it would join others in making cobalt-free batteries, including contemporary Amperex technology, which makes lithium-ion phosphate batteries for Tesla Model 3s that are sold in China. All right, let's talk a little more about the big news from Microsoft. Let's do it. Microsoft announced the free upgrade to Windows 11, which will begin rolling out on October 5th. Put it on your calendar, starting with new devices, then coming to other devices in phases with all eligible devices getting the upgrade by mid-2022. Windows Update will alert Windows 10 users when they're ready for the upgrade, but you can also check yourself if you're so inclined in either Windows Update or the PC Health Check app. However... Even if you get Windows 11 on October 5th, you won't be getting the promised support for Android apps just not quite yet. The partnership with Amazon and Intel to bring Android apps to Windows will come to Windows Insiders in the coming months, but there's no word exactly on when it will roll out to all Windows 11 users. Windows 11 will feature Microsoft Teams integration, also a new design and an updated start menu, and an improved Microsoft Store, among other features. I mean, I'm looking forward to getting Windows 11. I've got a couple years old machine. Uh, it's an Alienware. Uh, it's 
it's got like a 700 series NVIDIA card, if that tells you how old it is. Uh, so I doubt I'll be getting it right on October 5th. There's usually a way to force that update if you want. So I'll probably do that. Uh, I'm looking forward to Android apps on Windows 11. I, I have them on Chrome OS, which obviously, you know, that's all in the family with Google, but it's really useful to be able to, to just download some Android apps. They're not always perfectly suited for Chrome OS, uh, but I've got a touch screen on my Chrome OS, so that kind of gets around some of the issues you have when you take something from mobile to a desktop. Uh, so I'm looking forward to being able to take advantage of that on Windows as well. Yeah, I don't have a, well, I have a Windows machine. It's, it's sitting in my closet. So, uh, you know, but I, I'm actually made dust, dust it off and, and, and download this. I, I, one of the things I've always said about Windows that, that I'm glad Windows 11 is addressing and maybe even more so with the Android apps is the, the, this is, I don't know if this is a word, the synchronicity <laughs> or, or that, that Apple has. Synchronicity. Yeah. <laughs> the synchronicity that, that, that <laughs> Apple has with this stuff, you know, just, just from even from, um, you know, like airdrop or things like that, you know, they can kind of start narrowing the gap on how to get things easier from your phone to, you know, to your, to, yeah, to your computer yeah. and, and, a, in a, you know, in a much free flowing way, I'm all for it. I, I, cause I, I just never understood how windows, which is large as they are, does not have a seamless feature. Like that. I know they don't have phones anymore, but you know, I, I'm glad to see 11, some 11 is addressing. They They've they've made progress since you last put your Windows machine in the closet. There there's a oh, lot more they? synchronous stuff out there. Yeah. Okay. For sure. But yeah, I'm with, I'm with you, Lamar. I I I have a Windows machine. I I I don't use it regularly. But I uh when when iOS apps and Mac OS uh, uh, iPad OS apps rather came to Mac OS, I it, I had some pretty mixed results with some of the apps where I was like, this would actually be really great on the desktop, you know, because it's something that I'm, I, you know, I don't need to reach for my phone all the time if I'm kind of doing desktop stuff. You know, it leaves a little bit to be desired, but I can see where the Android apps on Windows 11 would be uh, super helpful for some folks. And it when I when I read some of the stories about this this morning, it made it seem like, oh, no, look at Microsoft. But they're not ready for Android apps. That's what they promised us. But it doesn't sound like it's no in anyone's life just yet. Yeah, I don't feel like it's a must have. It's a nice to have. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I can get the Windows Insider preview if I'm really hot to to try it. It's not like I can't do that. Yep. So Google is adding a panel called Time Insights to its calendar app. It will show several graphs charting how much time you spend in meetings. Now, a pie chart called Time Breakdown divides your working hours between one-on-one -on -one meetings and group meetings. A graph called time in meetings breaks down each day by how much time you spend in meetings and reports an overall average time per day spent in meetings. Now, Google says that this information will only be visible to users, not managers. Users can minimize the section but not turn it off, though workspace admins will, can disable the feature. Now, Time Insights is rolling out gradually over the next few months on Google Workspace Business Standard, Business Plus, Enterprise Standard, Enterprise Plus, Education Plus, and nonprofit subscription tiers. I did not know they had that many tiers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's so many tiers. <laughs> on Google. Uh, I, the, the, for, okay, for data nerds who just want to have personal data and be like, ooh, what's my meeting breakdown? This is wonderful. For if you're trying to make, if you're trying to win an argument with somebody about too many meetings, maybe this is useful. But I'm not. I don't really believe this is going to change meeting culture to to have this there. Maybe I'm just not, you know, believing enough that that the data can prevail. But I imagine everybody will say, "Yeah, sure, we sure do have a lot of meetings." But I'm not canceling the one I call because mine's important. Yeah, the 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 whole information being visible to the Google Calendar user, but not a manager in some sort of a workplace environment, is also sort of like. Okay, well, if if Tom's my manager and I say, Tom, we're having too many meetings, <laughs> I've got all this data, then it's sort of like, well, why didn't Tom also just get the data if we work together? Well, for privacy, right? That, uh, as soon as Google says managers can see this, everybody is up in arms and like, oh, so you're letting oh, my manager yeah, you spy put on, me on your calendar and taking my personal data. Uh, it's It's like you can't, even though like the member meetings you have in work is probably well known to your boss. Like everybody's so sensitive about personal data and spying yes. even at work. Yes. That's why they did. That's why they made a point of saying, and your manager can't see this, you know, this is just you. So it can't but, be used I, against you. I, I like Sarah's point though, because 
like I don't use workspace or anything like that. But you know, just thinking back when when I was in kind of a corporate setting, you you know you, you do have separate calendars on Google, do you not? You have your personal yeah. calendar. Mm-hmm. You have your yeah. You know, your, your I work, do. Or yeah, you have your work calendar. So like I don't see if the manager is, is the person making the meetings or or at least managing them. Yeah, if you've got nothing manager. to hide, why not let yeah. them know? It's it's just <laughs> the world we live in, I think. Is yeah. that that people are very especially when Google's involved and when your workplace wants to know data about you, uh, people get weirded out. It's the slippery slope argument, like, oh, they'll they, if they start to see my calendar, my meeting percentage time, maybe they'll think I'm slacking off because my meeting percentage isn't as much as others. People uh, worry about stuff like okay. that. Oh boy, it, it, this is a little. Yeah. I love data. I yeah. I, this would be something that I would be curious to check out. Uh, I only use Google Calendar, okay. you know, for for certain things, but but in general, I like the sort of thing. But I liken it a little bit to when my iPhone tells me once a week what my screen time was right. over the last week. And it's like, I look at it and I'm like, yeah, well, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? You know? I feel I'd like I'd be on my phone a lot last week. Well, because because here screen time works because screen time is something you theoretically have control over. If you're like, ooh, my screen time was way up. Okay, I'm going to cut down. You can do that. Meetings are not something you are the yeah, only one they, who has control over, right? Like they often, yeah, involve other people and you might yeah. be roped into something. And, and maybe mandatory and, and all that. <laughs> it's, it's a great way to complain to your boss. Too many meetings. Yeah, let me show you the screenshot. Uh, Protocol's Amber Burton has an article called There Aren't Enough Data Scientists, How the Future of Reskilling in Tech is Changing. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, job openings reached a high of 10.1 million in June 2021, and many of those are high-skilled tech jobs. Companies can't afford to wait around for students to finish up master's and Ph.D. programs before they fill these jobs. There's just not enough coming out and graduating. So they're turning to cross-training and upskilling, where you train somebody already in a job to do a new job. Corporations are increasingly paying for employees to do this. Uh, In fact... Paying for employees to do things they've been paying for themselves in the past, like taking courses on Udacity. Udacity offers so-called nano degrees, uh, very short courses in things like data science and cloud computing. Udacity is entirely online, but there are others that do hybrid. Fuse Machines offers classes that are partially online and partially in person. They focus primarily on AI and work directly with corporations on this. Their business is focused on helping corporations reskill or upskill their existing employees. These companies say they don't see themselves as competitors to traditional colleges, but the colleges seem to. Uh, colleges are exploring offering upskilling and non-resident training. Carnegie Mellon, for instance, uh, Carnegie Mellon's Dean of Computer Science, Marshall Herbert, told Protocol he's working with colleagues on a way to reformat the master's program for professionals who don't live near Carnegie Mellon like, and, and don't want to go for a full master's program. Herbert said, quote, the old model for educating employees is no longer realistic for rapidly changing fields. I love this. I love, and I, I, I love the story in the sense of, especially because we talk uh, here on DTNS, you know, and, and elsewhere all the time about, okay, AI taking people's jobs. What are they going to do next? You know, you have to go get your real estate license. Like, are you going to be out of a job? You know, if you're a, if if you work for a trucking company and all of a sudden the truck can drive itself, there are all sorts of ways that companies are trying to get creative about. You no, know, we want to keep this employee. And this employee is is highly skilled, but maybe can be of better use to everybody in this other uh, uh, area that that mm-hmm. that they need a little bit of training in. They don't need to quit their job and go to get a master's degree. That is not only not feasible for a lot of people geographically, certainly financially. Uh, and so for colleges to kind of be waking up and saying, Hmm. Okay, Th- these are also things that we can offer because we want to be in th- in the game as well. I think that's great. Yeah, and these companies, uh, as I mentioned, uh, mentioned here uh, when you read it, Tom, they don't have t- the time. They don't have forty six years to wait for you to get your you know degree. They they yeah. they need people. They, and and so if you have people already in the seats, why not enhance the training? If you if you don't have the skills to do it uh, as a manager or as the owner of the company yourself. Then you have these companies like Udacity, which I had not heard of, but I, I love this term nano degrees. Just it's like, hey, something very specific you need to be trained in. And w- will they undercut universities? Sure. I kind of hope so. I, the, the whole university, you know, thing, I don't want to say it needs to collapse, but it, you know, it, 
it's sometimes it it takes too long to get certain things. You know, you can get right in the door and get working. That's why I love trade schools as I was coming up and you see those dying off, you know, which is a shame. It's good to see them c coming back in this capacity. Yeah, I hadn't uh, thought about it. This is kind of the modern day trade school, right? Yeah. Where, where unlike traditional trades, it's it's you know, teaching teaching modern you know, digital era trades, I suppose you could look at it that way. Yeah, I, I, I think this is really fascinating because Udacity has made its money off of employees who wanted to gain a new skill, but the company wouldn't pay for it. So they'd get the new skill and they'd go find another job that paid them more. Co companies have caught on to that and be like, well, we can't fill the positions we have. Maybe we just try to keep the people who are already familiar with what we do and mm -hmm. train them because you can take AI and automate more tedious uh, knowledge worker jobs, and then take those people, upskill them to be an actual data scientist and, and keep them in the family. I think, I think that's a, a fascinating trend to keep an eye on for sure. Absolutely. Hey folks, if you need just the headlines some days, you're like, man, I love the 30 minutes, but sometimes, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a crush because I'm taking that Udacity course. I don't have time. Uh, Daily Tech Headlines is right there. Check out our related show, all the essential tech news in just about five minutes. Go find it at dailytechheadlines.com. South Korea's National Assembly passed an amendment to South Korea's Telecommunications Business Act on Tuesday. This is big. It prohibits large app store operators, basically Google and Apple, from requiring the use of their in-app purchasing systems. The Korean Communication Commission may fine a company up to 3% of their South Korean revenue if found in violation. Now, the legislation was created last year after Google began to enforce its rule that all developers had to use Google's in-app in payment system. Previously, they only had to enforce uh, the rule for game developers. The law was nicknamed the Google Power Abuse Prevention Law. Yeah, I think in the U.S. Uh, we get in the habit of thinking about App Store uh, in-app payment battle as being between Apple and either the government or Epic, uh, whereas in South Korea, it was all about Google. Uh, it still applies yeah. to Apple there. And while South Korea is a small percentage of the worldwide market for both these companies, this is a template now. This is an important market uh, that will now serve as a template. And I am I, both both Apple. Well, I don't know that Apple even responded to this yet. Last time I looked, but Google had said like we will look and see how we can you know preserve a good experience. Blah 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 blah. Uh, I I wonder what these companies are going to do in reaction. In the past, Google has just said, we'll pull out of a market uh, if it's something like this. I doubt they do that when they've got a very lucrative partnership with Samsung, mm -hmm. and this is Samsung's home market. Yeah, it looks like Apple did say something. Uh, like It said after the committee decision, it was concerned that users who purchase digital goods through the payment systems will be at greater risk of fraud and privacy. It's uh, kind of like the, yeah. oh, for the, ch the children. The, That's you know, the, but old, the, the old privacy it, and security thing. All yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. I, I, I like this idea. Uh, Sarah, you want to say something? Sorry. No, no. I, I, oh. <laughs> just, I, th I thought I heard you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. It, I, I, I pretty much agree with both of you uh, on this. I think that this is, you know, sure, it's perhaps not either company's largest market, but if the companies comply and say, sure, okay, fine, we'll give you 3% of, of the, you know, the revenue uh, that, that happens in South Korea. Do other, uh, do other countries follow suit and does it get messy? And this reminds me of just, uh, especially the recent conversation that we were having in various markets about paying publishers. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's like the companies, they can afford it for now. They can totally afford it, but if they if they roll over too much, then d does their does their structure break down too much for for it to be comfortable for them? Yeah, but yeah, I'm oh, sorry. It's an interesting thought of like, would it be worthwhile for them to just pay the three percent like a tax? Yeah, yeah, and, and get just get fined every year and be like, well, that's the cost of doing business in South Korea. I think they calculated this to make it not make sense for them to do that, but. It, I wouldn't put it past one of them to try it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's three three percent of their total revenue of everything they make in that in South Korea. In right? South it's, Korea, yeah, 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 yeah. So that that yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I was thinking that in the pre-show, would what, what they just like fine? We'll do we'll deal with that fine every month or day. I don't know who knows how that's allocated, but yeah, we'll see.
Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you know the United States and Europe are going to be looking at this to see what Apple and Google do in reaction because there are similar rules uh, and China as well uh, uh, being considered there. Anthony Colangelo from Main Engine Cutoff Podcast has some additional info on what we were talking about yesterday, uh, where Ming-Chi Kuo was saying that Apple uh, is probably going to put a Qualcomm modem in a future iPhones that would allow for satellite connectivity. Anthony Colangelo here from Main Engine Cutoff. I wanted to provide some context for the iPhone 13 satellite connectivity story from yesterday. And unfortunately, this one does not look like a satellite connectivity story, although there is something in this regard to track in the future. The confusion here comes from the fact that the Qualcomm chip we were talking about yesterday operates with Spectrum that is currently owned by Global Star, who does in fact operate 24 low Earth orbit satellites for satellite phone connectivity. In this case, though, the Spectrum we're talking about is actually for use back down here on Earth for private wireless networks. They're operating something like this right now at the port of Seattle to test out a wider area private wireless network in partnership with Nokia. So it looks like the iPhone is going to be expanding its 5G coverage, not necessarily offering cell phone to satellite connection just yet. However, there's a company called Link, that's Link with a Y, who is operating satellites in low Earth orbit right now. They have five launched with plans to launch more this December and then more in the spring and summer, leading to commercial service in 2022. And what they offer is satellite connection to unmodified cell phones. That means no new hardware to connect to their satellites, and they're able to send text messages uh, via these satellites. In fact, in February 2020, they did send a text message to an Android phone located in the Falkland Islands when their test payload passed overhead on top of a Cygnus cargo vehicle. So all's well there so far with their testing. They're heading to commercial service next year, and we could see this starting to be offered by way of mobile network operators uh, sometime in 2022, probably 2023, because all space things are always late. And if you want to stay up with those space things that are always late, head over to managingcutoff.com where I'm talking about this kind of stuff every single week. Now, that's interesting because today Mark Gurman of Bloomberg has sources saying the satellite capability that Ming-Chi Kuo was referring to and is in that Qualcomm modem will be used for a feature called Emergency Message via Satellite, codenamed uh, inside Apple as Project Stewie. The messages will have a length limit, so you can't send a lot. Uh, they'll use a gray bubble instead of the traditional blue or green. And if you're contacting your emergency contacts, it'll break through the do not disturb setting. Uh, so if they have you set to do not disturb, if they have their phone set to do not disturb, but you're an emergency contact, they'll still see your message. Another feature would let you report the kind of emergency you're having to emergency services, uh, say like you're in a car accident or experiencing a fire. It would also allow you to send location and medical ID to emergency services. Also, even if the next iPhone is capable of all of this, the features don't appear to be ready to roll out at launch, likely coming sometime next year. Now, I'm a little mixed up on this because Anthony is pointing out like, the spectrum in that Qualcomm modem is used for this 5G related thing, but there's a service that doesn't require that modem that can do all the stuff that German sources are telling him Apple wants to do. Uh, so I wonder, I, I'm curious if there's a combination of this and the fact that it's not going to launch for another couple of years makes me think maybe it is tied into that link company that Anthony was talking about. Uh, but, but it does bring it a little more into focus as to what they're up to, I think. Yeah, in, in general, like, I don't know much about this. I, I'm still learning this kind of dynamically, but I, I really do like the idea of just, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you, you need to get an emergency out or, or you're yeah, in a yeah. bad, I think, I think, Sarah, you mentioned a, a bad cell ser service area, you know, if you oh, go through- Oh, I live in one. Okay. <laughs> so. I mean, let, let's, we'll, we'll call it the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's not really the middle of nowhere, but yeah, I live in an area where there's extremely bad cell service. Wi-Fi is fine, but if the power goes out, I got to drive 30 minutes to get my phone working again if oh, I wow. really needed to get a hold of somebody. Yeah. And when you're in California and fire season and all that stuff, this has happened to me more than a few times now. And to have any sort of emergency service on any of the level that we're we're hearing about now would be really advantageous, truly. Yeah. Do you have to get do you have to get like a do you have a backup satellite plan or something or for well, emergencies or well we have a generator here. So when the power goes out, the Wi-Fi stays on. Oh, okay. But the hmm. generator was broken for some time. Uh, so it's it's not a perfect system. It's it, yeah. this is why in in a in a true emergency, 
these sorts good. of things do yeah. save people's lives. Not even yeah. kidding. Definitely. You know what else well, saves people's lives? What's Pizza. that? Yeah, it really does. Man, it does. I'm gonna have uh, to group, order something. Uh, <laughs> a group of astronauts at the International Space Station, speaking of pizza, released footage of a pizza party they were having. They were having a pizza party. Now, pizza p- pizza brings people together. People have pizza parties all the time, but usually the pizza is not floating in zero G's. French astronaut Thomas Pesquet posted a clip earlier this week to Instagram of their group all in the ISS making the pizzas. And then they float because, you know, gravity in space. It's a really great video if you haven't seen it yet. Kind of heartwarming. Now, Instagram user Possumness brought up a good point in the comments. Possumness said, now, why the pizza floats but the toppings stay on top of the pizza is mysterious. I was looking at that myself. And it looks to me like they use the pizza sauce because it comes out of a ketchup bottle looking thing. They use the Mm. pizza sauce as glue. So, because he put a little few dollops of pizza sauce, then he put the pepperoni on. So I think the the pizza sauce must be extra <laughs> sticky it's, or something. It's holding it together. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. Gl- it's gluey sauce. Why well, yeah, does it taste good still? Yeah, pizza sauce. Yeah. So yeah. Pizza Hut. I'm sorry, you'll never get yeah, a pizza sponsorship now. I just I used messed to work it up for, pizza for you. Hut. I feel like I. Just feel like... <laughs> I don't know. I uh, I I I know. There are always so many jokes about what astronauts have to eat, and just the pizza party video is yeah made me happy. Turns out they can make fresh pizzas, so you yeah. Know, today's so space and they're station. floating around, and you know, ooh, yeah. look at look at my personal pizza. They I'm also gonna made eat hamburgers, it. and like they they're not eating that that dried out '60s astronaut food anymore. It's different. Yeah, it is not a tang life anymore. <laughs> All right, let's check out that mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Russell. Uh, Russell says, I know Tom's mentioned his novel, Project Vera, on the show, but I wanted to let you know that I downloaded it on Audible and I listened to it over the weekend and I thought the story was really fun, well-crafted, and the audiobook performance was great and really enhanced the story. So definitely recommend it. I think it's my favorite of Tom's books so far. Oh, thanks, Russell. Yeah, that's really nice. Russell also said, I got, got another pick that might interest the DTNS audience. This one comes from Andrew Maine. I know he's been on the show from time to time. He has a new book coming out on September 7th called Mastermind. And the fun thing about this is it combines the main characters from two of his series, Jessica Blackwood and Theo Gray. Both are interesting in their own right, and I think pairing them up is a really fun idea. This was sort of hinted at at the last Naturalist book, so it's great to see it happen. Russell also says, I really enjoyed Experiment Week. That was our week last week where DTNS in its regular form was off, but we tried a bunch of new stuff and we had a bunch of new shows as a result. Russell says, I thought the diversity of topics was really interesting and especially helpful was the photography episode with Ant Pruitt. As I'm thinking of getting my first DSLR and the insight was great. Well, thank you, Russell. And thanks to everybody who's been sending us uh, their their thoughts on on what they liked uh, and didn't like uh, on Experiment Week. It's definitely helping us figure out uh, what we're going to do with all those ideas. So keep that feedback coming. Indeed. And feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your emails, questions, comments. All the feedback goes there. Thank you in advance. We love to hear from you. We also love our patrons. And we'd like to thank our brand new boss, Tim Barber, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Tim. Tim, 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 Tim. Be like Tim. Be like Tim. Be like Tim. We need more new patrons. Today's the last day before the new month. So we need like 16 patrons to keep us level for for the month. Come on in. Come on in. The water's fine. Get over here. Also, thanks to Lamar Wilson, (laughs) one of my favorite swimmers. Uh, Lamar, where can people keep up with your work? Um, you come visit me at Lamar.tv. That's Lamar with two R's because I make uh, just fun, short unboxing videos on every platform now. So it's the same thing everywhere. So you you don't like Twitter? It's okay. I'm on Instagram. Just, just come on over. It'll be fun. Well, we always love having you on the show, Lamar. Thank uh, you. Come back early and often. We're also live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with Patrick Norton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>